before lunch, we went very quickly, really, through a very complicated subject about, you know, what hydration is, what the microstructure is, and everything like that. Um, <coughs> as I explained right at the beginning, the tendency, which is going to continue, is to use more and more additions in materials. We call these additions SCMs. SCM stands for Supplementary Cementitious Materials. And what I'm going to try and talk about in this section is how these modify the microstructure of cement. So this is just to summarize what we said earlier, that currently what we're interested in is modifying the clinker factor. And this is to say that the process is already optimized and this is the best way to then further reduce CO2 emissions. So conventionally, we have uh, clinker and we have gypsum, which we grind to cement. And nowadays, we're using an uh, increasing number of additions, these supplementary cementing materials. Uh, these are often byproducts or wastes from other industries. And we have limestone. Limestone is the best from the point of view that it's virtually free because it's right available at the cement plant. Unfortunately, it's not the most reactive. Only moderate amounts react. Uh, we have fly ash, which comes from coal-fired coal power stations. We have blast furnace slag. We have silica fume. And we have increasing range of natural materials, natural pozzolans, calcined clays, etc. Now, what we're going to look, about, look into here, we're going to introduce these materials. We're going to talk a little bit about the thermodynamics and the final microstructure, uh, some about the impact they have on the kinetics of the reaction. And continually, I'm going to come back to this diagram because this shows that when we have these supplementary cementitious materials, they're all kind of uh, have similar or related chemical compositions. So here we see the three most important oxides. We see silica here, calcium here, alumina here. Okay, so these are the three most important oxides in cement and the three most important oxides for all the phases that form. And if we look at these supplementary cementitious materials, we see that basically they extend along this line so we've got Portland cement here, slag, fly ash of different kinds. So these have similar silica to calcium ratios, but sorry, silica, similar silicon to alumina ratios, but less calcium as we go in this direction. And the consequence of having less calcium, in fact, means that they become less and less reactive as we go in that direction. So let's just look briefly about what these materials are. I'm sure a lot of you know these already. Um, first one we'll look at is slag. Slag comes from the, produ from the production of iron in a blast furnace. It's the material that's used to encourage the separation of iron from all the impurities in the iron ore. Okay? It's a liquid. And then this liquid is very rapidly quenched. And it, the rep, rapid quenching gives you a glassy phase, okay? Now, that glass is then ground up. So you see in this picture here, you see the very angular slag grains. It's very angular because it's a glass. You can imagine if you break uh, the glass of water on your table, the glass shatters into little tiny shards, which have very sharp edges. And this is really what slag is. Now, it's mostly glass but sometimes we can get a little bit of it which forms crystalline phases and in the scanning electron microscope we can see these really quite easily. You see here, this is a crystal of merwinite which is one of the phases that forms uh, in this glassy matrix. Now scientifically, slag is a very nice material to study in cements because it's quite homogeneous. Generally the composition is the same throughout. Uh, also, if we just go back here, it's very close in composition to Portland cement. And because it's very close in composition, this means we can really add very high amounts of slag and still has a material that has good uh, mechanical and other properties. I so showed you in the European norm, there are even blends that go up to 95% of slag. Finally, the composition here, um, 
you see we've got roughly equal amounts of calcium and silicon, very little iron, that's what you want because the iron you want to make uh, into, iron, into iron and then steel, and considerable amounts of magnesium. So magnesium is one of the elements that's very, very important in the action of slag in the blast furnace and um, has quite a big impact on the chemistry of the final microstructure. Second material is fly ash. This is um, produced in coal-fired power stations. Uh, basically, the coal contains small inclusions of other minerals. You can imagine how coal was formed from the decomposition of trees. Those trees would have had bits of soil encapsulated in them. And those uh, impurities are not burnt in the combustion process. They either go into the uh, uh, emission or they drop down as ash. So the emission, this is, this is, these are the cooling towers here, so these are not emissions, that's just water vapour. This is the stack where you're burning the, um, um, where the, the coal uh, exhaust is going up, and you have filters in this which trap all these impurities, and these little particles here, these are what's called fly ash because it goes up in the, in the plume and then condenses out. So the reason they're formed as these little circles is because it was liquid which is now condensed. Okay? And the main uh, components of both of these fly ashes is silica. Okay? So <laughs> silica which is the basis of all glass uh, along with considerable amounts of aluminium, iron and very variable amounts of calcium. So we typically have two categorizations of fly ash. We have what's called low calcium fly ash. This is generally the type of fly ash we have mostly in Europe. And then we have high calcium fly ash. This is uh, what we find much more in North America. And because it's got more calcium in this, will generally tend to be a little bit more reactive. Now, Fly ash is quite difficult to study from a scientific point of view because all of these little spheres here can have quite different compositions. It's not one homogeneous liquid that's quenched like a slag, it's individual droplets, the individual droplets coming from different lumps of coal, for example, and these individual droplets can have very, very different uh, compositions. Some can be hollow, uh, some can have crystals in. Here we can see the crystals that are very present in this. This is a, a fly ash particle that has been in cement paste, so it started to react. And because it started to react, the glassy phase has kind of been dissolved away, and this enables you to see very clearly these crystals. And for these reasons, it's actually very difficult to study from a scientific point of view. On the other hand, it's was until about uh, 30 or 40 years ago really a waste material. There's still many, many thousands and millions of tons of fly ash uh, in landfill sites. So being able to use this in uh, cement and concrete is a very, very useful um, thing. Third material is silica fume. Now, I mean, this is a, a, an addition. It started off as being a byproduct to waste, but it reacts so well in cement that now it's, you can hardly call it a waste material because in fact it can be sold for three or four or five times the price of cement. So um, silica fume comes from the production of silicon metal. Okay, so we have sand, which is silicon dioxide. If we want to make wafers, silicon wafers, you put it in your computer, you have to reduce that silicon dioxide to silicon, and in the process, uh, you get this uh, vapors given, well, well, not vapors, but you get this liquid droplets again given off, which is silica fume. Now, these are very, very fine particles, and because they're very fine particles, they tend to agglomerate. So these are agglomerates of particles here, and this picture here, you can see the individual particles. So this is a, a transmission electron microscope take, micrograph taken at different angles. You can see the individual beads of silica fume. They're of the order of 100 nanometers. So they're one-tenth of a micron in size, 10 to 100 times smaller than the grains of cement. And this 
uh, is why they are so useful because if you think about this particle packing effect we talked about right at the beginning having these very very small particles these can fill up spaces between larger particles and can give us uh, very high strength materials you've got many grades of silica fume so here we see a nice white silica fume. You can also get silica fumes which are quite grey, and they're grey because of contamination with things like iron, etc. So that's silica fume, and then, and uh, okay, so now we want to look at how those different materials affect the phases we form. Now. For those of you who haven't done something like material science, this diagram is probably a bit difficult to get your head around. But what we see here, we see the distribution of hydrates. So it's a kind of a version of a phase diagram that show which hydrates we expect to form as a function of the composition of the three main ingredients, hydrated lime, hydrated alumina, and hydrated silica. Okay? Now, hydrated lime is obviously calcium hydroxide we've met earlier. In between silica and lime, we get the CSHs, which we've also discussed earlier. And you'll see here the very wide range of composition that we know exists for CSHs. Down here, we get the calcium aluminate phases. In order to not make it too confusing, I've just labeled one of these, the hydrogarnet phase, and the other phases are very close to it along this axis here. And we've really only got one major hydrate that seems to form in the middle of this, i.e. one hydrate that contains both silica and alumina, and that's strecklingite. Strecklingite, which is actually one of these AFM phases, so it's sheets of calcium aluminate oxide with uh, aluminosilicate ions in between. So, now, if we superimpose those two things, and I mean, this is just quite schematic, um, but gives you the broad idea, you can see that the Portland cement is in the, this domain here, and being in this domain here, this tells us that Portland cement should give us a mixture of calcium hydroxide, of CSH, and of calcium aluminate phases. And that's what we've already seen before. Okay? So anything in this section of the diagram here is basically going to give us those calcium hydroxide, CSH, and calcium aluminate phases. So we see that slag actually still has a composition in this domain, which means that slag actually will react on its own with water to give you CSH and calcium aluminates. It doesn't react very fast on its own. For example, if you mix slag with water, it won't really harden for a matter of days, uh, if not weeks, uh, and that's not very practical. But when you mix it with Portland cement, you speed up the reaction. And when you mix it with Portland cement, the overall composition will lie on the line between these two circles here. So, for example, if you had 50% Portland cement, 50% slag, the composition would lie in between those two. And this actually shows us that the composition of blends with slag will be very similar to what we have for Portland cement. As we start to look at fly ashes, which come here, and so blends of fly ashes will be on the line between these two, a 50-50 mixture would be here, we would see already a 50-50 mixture of low lime fly ash and Portland cement would now come into this region here, which means there's no longer any calcium hydroxide. We get CSH phases and we would get uh, silica or alumina gel. Now, in fact, that doesn't happen because the fly ash only will react when you've got calcium hydroxide or something else to provide calcium which will enable the fly ash to react. And that's why blends with fly ash normally are limited to the range of about 30%. Silica fume you see right up here, so blends will lie on this line and generally we're adding very small amounts of silica fume in the range 10 to 20% maximum. Now, that's kind of showing you diagrammatically like that. To make it more accurate, you can do the kind of thermodynamic modeling. 
uh, one of our colleagues in NanoSTEM working at EMPA, Barbara Lothenbach, is a specialist in this. And this is a diagram from uh, one of her papers which shows what you predict to form as you add more and more silica fume. So, sorry, I'm going to make a correction here because there's a bad mistake on this slide. Which I I yeah, you can ask a question, yes. Okay, um, I guess you have just said that the silica fume is, can be sold up to five times the prices of the, yeah. the ready-made cement. So if you add 20% um, of silica fume into a cement, how can you sell it then economically? Well, that's a very good point. And that's the point I made my, right at the beginning, that you're really limited with where you can go in concrete in terms of price. But to answer, give a more sensible answer, the great virtue about silica fume is you can use it to produce very high strength concrete. So you can produce high, you know, typical everyday concrete will be about 25, 30 megapascals. But you can produce for specialist applications concrete up to say even 140 megapascals. So that's something that's four or five times stronger so if it's four or five times stronger, you need not so much. And therefore, you can compensate the higher price by the higher performance. Okay? So uh, that's basically the explanation. So what we see on this graph here is that we're supposing we have blends of Portland cement and increasing additions of silica fume. And this is showing us the assemblages of phases that then form. And what we see over on this axis is what we've already looked at. We have CSH, we have Portlandite, we have a little bit of hydrotalkite, we have a lot of ettringite, we have some monocarbonate because these are blends with lime, a little bit of limestone, and this gives us a certain volume of products. Don't worry too much about this genite like CSH and tobamorite like CSH. Uh, this is really just something that's done to help the uh, thermodynamic modeling. What we see is that at quite low additions of silica fume, above only about 10%, we've already run out of Portlandite. Okay? And I mean, this stress is why it doesn't really make much sense to add much more than 10% silica fume because there isn't enough Portlandite to react with it. And after that, then the fly ash will continue to react with calcium that's in these uh, CSH phases. And incidentally, that explains why we go from this genite-like. Genite-like is, is an idea of a CSH with a very high calcium to silicon ratio. And tobamorite-like is like a CSH with a lower calcium to silicon ratio. And as we go beyond, say, 30%, you see we've got no longer any calcium available and we start to have silica, unreacted silica, basically. Now, what's also very interesting in this thermodynamic modeling, and it's generally true for all supplementary cementitious materials, is that our total volume of products is actually decreasing. Okay. Now, that seems counterintuitive, as I'll come on to explain in a minute. We've talked right at the beginning how cement doubles its volume. And this is very important. I mean, it's a huge increase in volume, doubling volume. There's nothing else that can give you this huge increase in volume. When you get hydration products from these supplementary materials, you maybe get an increase in solid volume of, say, one and a half times or something like that. So at the end of the day, you will always have higher porosity. Now, we, those of you who've studied cements before will kind of say, well, that doesn't make sense because we also know that if we produce the material well enough, I've just told you that additions of silica fumes can help to give you very high strength. Okay, so that's like a counter, counter uh, argument that I've said that the lower the porosity you have, the better the properties you have. And here I'm saying you add silica fume, you have higher porosity, but you have higher strength. Okay, so that's a basic conundrum we still don't well understand. We have the basic idea of what happens is that we change the size of the porosity. So we produce much finer pores rather than a few big pores and that helps in, far, for, in terms of strength development.
But that's just an important point to point out because, again, that's a common misconception about supplementary cementitious materials. So that's a general idea looking at the different materials. But for the most of the rest of the time, we're going to concentrate on slag. And we're going to concentrate on slag because this was studied in an enormous amount of detail in the NanoSem Core Project 4, which was carried out by Vanessa Kokoba. So this is where we have the best and most detailed data. But the things we see with slag will be generally true, and I mean there's a large number of publications in the literature which show this, will be generally true for other sem supplementary cementitious materials according to their overall composition. So at the outset, I'm going to show you these two micrographs. These are both in very uh, well hydrated paste, paste that been hydrated for one year. And on the left, we have the paste for the Portland cement. This is similar to all the microstructures we've already looked at. You should by now be familiar with the unhydrated cement grains, the rims of inner product calcium silicate hydrate around that, the calcium hydroxide, as we see here, and then this very fine uh, CSH, pores, etc. On the right-hand side, we see the, the, the paste with slag, and the first thing you can notice is these grains here, which have a slightly different gray level from the cement grains. You can also tell they're slag grains because they have this very angular appearance like I told you at the beginning. These are slag grains. And you can see the degree of reaction of the slag by the fact that they have these fairly dark rims uh, around the edge. So these dark rims around the edge are dark because of the presence of magnesia uh, magnesia hydrates to give us other compounds which are quite dark in color and so these dark rims are now mixtures of CSH with uh, magnesia uh, containing compounds. You can see there's still quite a lot of calcium hydroxide available. That's quite important because calcium hydroxide is very uh, important to protect the steel we put in concrete and stop it corroding. Um, also, though, you can probably, it's a bit difficult, this magnification, but start to get an idea that this kind of outer CSH is looking, starting to look quite a bit different from in this case here. It tends to look more homogeneous, more even, tends, seems to have less small pores in it, um, and we can see it, the distinction between the rims around the hydrate grains and this, out, and this outer product is less distinct than in the case of pure Portland cement. If we expand the magnification, we can start to get a better idea of that. Here again are these hollow shells, by the way, we talked about earlier. You can now see these hollow shells are really in a very, very dense matrix. This outer product CSH has now really seems to have densified and be quite even, as opposed to, in this case, a Portland cement, where there's still a lot of porosity intermixed. And if we go to transmission electron microscopes, uh, this is from a recent publication by the group of Ian Richardson, there you can really see there's a fundamental difference in the morphology of this CSH. Here's the Portland cement case where you seem to have this kind of fibrillar, material. Here's the case with the slag blends where you have what they call foil-like. So we've changed quite fundamentally our CSH and this uh, will have a big impact on the transport of water in these systems. Now compositionally we can look at what that co change in composition of CSH means by looking at these average compositions. Before lunch, I explained how we can do these microanalyses. We can put these microanalyses into these plots of atomic ratios, silicon to calcium, aluminum to calcium, sulfur to calcium, and from that we can estimate the average composition. You see, it's always an average because there's quite large error bars on a lot of these points. And if we look at the plain Portland cement, 
This is the plain Portland cement at 28 days, 90 days, one year. We see that the ratios are all very high. They're very close to two. Typically, we say that the ratio in Portland cement paste should be about 1.7. And probably the ratios are higher than that because not only do they contain regions which are like calcium hydroxide, but they may even contain very small amounts of calcium hydroxide intermixed. If we flick back to the uh, microstructures here, you can see if when you're analyzing a point here, say, you may easily pick up a bit of cal this little bit of calcium hydroxide. Uh, but nevertheless, despite these problems of measurement, it's quite clear the difference that occurs when you introduce slag. So these are your reference cement systems, and these are then the blends with slag. In this case, they contain 40% slag. And quite quickly, even within 28 days, you see there's a huge drop in that calcium to silica ratio. Of the, Portland, uh, of the CSH. And this tends to show some variation with the type of slag. This is one type of slag, this is another type of slag, but it seems to come down to a level about this level of 1.5, which incidentally 1.5 is roughly the level that you can make CSH with from uh, co-precipitation. The second thing that's important to look at is you see that in each case there's two measurements, one measurement for the inner, one measurement for the outer. These are in general quite similar. In the Portland cement case, the outer are higher because there's more chance of intermixing with CSH. In the slag blends, we tend to see the outer is a bit lower because it tends to be more intermixed with slag. But even the inner product is quite, is quite significantly lower than in the case of the port, pure Portland cement. So what this says, this says that the composition of CSH tends to homogenize out. You don't see some CSH which comes from the reaction of slag and over here some that comes from the reaction of Portland cement. Even the CSH, which is right next to the Portland cement, which is this inner CSH, has a very similar composition to the outer CSH. And all of it has a much lower calcium to silica ratio than in the pure Portland cement. We've brought about a fundamental change in our CSH by the introduction of supplementary cementitious materials. And this example here is for slag, but you really see exactly the same thing if you put fly ash in or if you put silica fume in, uh, etc. And this can also be seen by other techniques like uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, notably. Okay, so what else is changing in the CSH? Well, what else is changing is the alumina content. I explained that uh, alumina could partially substitute for silicon. You see here, these are the alumina ratios for the pure Portland blends, typically hovering around 0.05 aluminium to silicon. And then when we put in slag, there's a significant increase in these aluminium levels. And this is firstly from the fact that we've got more alumina in the system, but secondly, as we decrease the calcium to silicon ratio of the CSH, the silicate chains become longer, and as the chains become longer, there's more bridging positions, and it's aluminium that can go into those bridging positions. The consequence of all of that is that the calcium, the small amount of calcium which is needed to hydrate the slag, actually comes mainly from the CSH, and much less from calcium hydroxide. You'll see that um, it's classically written, you have a reaction of fly ash, for example, with calcium hydroxide to form CSH. Slag, we see very little consumption of, of calcium hydroxide. Uh, these graphs here, I really want to emphasize, these are normalized according to the weight of cement. So in the 100% Portland cement blends, we've got 100% cement. 
in the composite cements, which are 60% Portland cement, Portland clinker, and 40% slag, then we've only got 60% as much, but we renormalize it to take out that effect. And when we renormalize it, we see the calcium hydroxide content is really quite constant uh, over time. So that's just putting these two things together, that the amount of calcium needed to hydrate the slag comes largely from the CSH and much less and only at much longer ages from the calcium hydroxide. Now, I showed you some thermodynamic predictions. Thermodynamic predictions have been shown to be very good compared to experimental results. And that's described in a lot more detail in the recommended reading. Uh, there's a paper which Barbara Lothenbach and I recently published in, calcium, in, sorry, in Cement and Concrete Research, um, which describes a lot more of these calculations. But here what I want to show you is that by using a coupled experimental approach and considering where the different ions can go, we can actually measure quite well the distribution of different phases. So the idea of this is that on this side, we've got the starting materials. We've got our phases that we have in our cement, C3S, C2S, C3A, C4AF. And we've got our supplementary cementitious materials. These all dissolve, so they go into solutions. Here are the different species. And according to the total amount of these, uh, these uh, um, elements we have, we can then try to work out how much of the different hydrates we have, Portlandite, CSH gel, um, AFT phases, AFM phases, and hydrotalkite light phase. I haven't talked much about that, but this is basically the kind of phase that forms with the magnesium. It's also a layered structure, but in this case, the layers are made of magnesium and aluminium as opposed to calcium and aluminium in the case of the AFM phases. So the procedure we used here, it's a little bit like the kind of approach that Bogue used to try and calculate what was in the clinker. That first of all, we measure what are the amount of the clinker phases and slag reacted. From that, we can work out the total amount of all these elements, calcium, silicon, aluminium, iron, magnesium, etc. <coughs> then we can say, okay, we know magnesium is just present in this hydrotalkite phase. We can measure the precise composition. This is the generic composition. But in cement mixes, we find that this ratio between magnesium and calcium can actually be not quite two, but around two. And from that, we can calculate how much aluminium is tied up in the hydrotalkite. We can say, okay, silicon, the only phase that contains silicon is CSH. We can measure the composition of the CSH in the way I showed you before, and therefore calculate how much calcium and how much aluminium is tied up in the CSH. We can use X-ray diffraction to measure the amount of ettringite and therefore calculate the amount of calcium, aluminium, and sulfur, which is in ettringite. We then could say the remaining sulfur is in molosulfur aluminate, etc., etc. But of course, I mean, this is just very long-winded to describe the basic concept behind it. You can put all this in a spreadsheet, and at the end of the day, it's just a matrix, reaction, uh, matrix calculation between everything you've got and everything you end up with. Uh, that just shows measuring the composition of the CSH phase, again, as I've shown you before. And this is what we end up with. And, it's, you know, I mean, it's not absolutely precise, as I've said many times, and as I'll talk about uh, at the end of the afternoon, all of our characterization techniques have uh, some kind of error in measurements. But what you can see here is for two sets of blends. These contain 40% slag. These contain 70% slag. We've got two different slag blends with slightly different compositions. And this gives an overall idea of what are the different phases present. Calcium hydroxide, AFM phases, hydrotalkite light phases, CSH, unreacted slag, unreacted uh, B-light phase. And you can see that in each pair, there's a pretty good agreement 
between what we can calculate from the mass balance approach and what we can then measure from other techniques. Now, what was the point of doing all of this? Because as you saw in the very beginning, we can get a pretty good stab at this from thermodynamic modeling, which is actually a lot easier. What thermodynamic modeling can't do yet, hopefully it will be able to do it in three or four years' time, when the people on the Synergia project have finished their uh, PhD thesis, is really deal with the fact that an awful lot of the aluminium ends up in the CSH. And this is what we wanted to study in this case. We wanted to say, where does the aluminium end up? Because in terms of some degradation reactions, particularly sulfate attack, the alumina is a very important constituent. And this is where the alumina ends up. Uh, this just shows in a pie chart the distribution of aluminium between the different phases. And what's very striking and what generally wasn't appreciated until we did this work was to see that nearly half of the alumina that's released into the system ends up in the calcium sulfur aluminate phase. And this, of course, has quite a drastic effect on the amount of aluminium available to form calcium aluminates, uh, monosulfate phases, and or ettringite. We don't happen to see much ettringite in these materials because these are paste that have been hydrated for about three months. And we can show that same information in another way. Um, here we see the starting composition. Again, we're focusing on the amount of alumina available. So the sum alumina come from the Portland cement, which of course is less in the blends because there's only respectively 60% and 30% of cement there. But the slag is bringing in a large contribution of alumina. Uh, you can see the difference between this slag and this slag is the alumina content of the slag. And then afterwards, after three months hydration, which is a pretty long state, you're pretty close to um, all the material reacted, you can see again the same thing, that most of the alumina is ending up in the CSH. And that's your final microstructures. This also shows you, um, says quite a bit about the amount of slag that's reacting. These figures are the Oh, sorry, these are, these are the porosities, and these reiterate what I said earlier, that according to thermodynamic modeling, we decrease the amount of solid phases produced, but we don't see that decrease reflected in what we actually measure experimentally, because here, across this range here, you can see that the porosities measured experimentally by mercury intrusion porosimetry are pretty much the same. So this says, you know, okay, we maybe have got higher porosity overall, but most of that porosity is maybe in the CSH and very difficult to measure. Um, I think we'll probably take the break there because I think we're about halfway through. And when we come back, we'll talk about uh, the effect of supplementary cementitious materials on kinetics and uh, how to measure the reaction of slag. Any questions? Uh, I don't know which slide 15 is. Say stop. Uh, yeah. Which one? Uh, yeah, this one? That one. Okay, that's the images of OPC versus OPC and slag. Yeah. And you said that OPC and slag is stronger than OPC, as high as slag. No, well, okay, yes. Is slag is a method of the It's a point like structure. Okay, so the biggest factor determining strength is porosity. And as I've tried to explain, we get a lot of changes in the porosity. And that's going to have the most effect on strength. There are people who are trying to, you know, say, does the strength of these different types of CSH vary? And that's a very good, so it's a very good question. I think at the minute it maybe does, but very, in a very small amount. The intrinsic difference in the strength of these materials is very close, differing only by, say, absolute maximum 10%, but we don't know the real answer yet. We don't know exactly how it affects it. And if we look, measure strength of a paste, this is all confused by all kinds of other things, the total amount of porosity, the arrangements of the phases, etc.
Yeah, we're looking at the calcium hydroxide, and the calcium hydroxide is only coming from the reaction of Portland cement. Yes, but if you normalize it, then you forget the fact that you have more stag, you have less cement, and yeah. it's also going to be less H. But we know that. We know that. What we want to see is, is the slag reacting with any of the calcium hydroxide? So we know if we only have 60% of, of Portland cement, we'll only have 60% of the calcium hydroxide. Yeah? What we want to see is, is any of that calcium hydroxide, which is produced by the reaction of Portland cement, then combining with the slag to form more CSH? Okay, so in this case, it is just a little bit, right? Just a little bit, exactly. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, it's important for your slide. And also, uh, I guess there are some uh, microstructure related things. Uh, will the uh, magnesium content affect the uh, performance of the cement? Ah, that's a very interesting question. And I mean, the short answer is we absolutely don't know. Uh, if we go back to look at these microstructures, um, you can see here you've got these dark rims around the slag. Now, this means, this, what this shows is that the magnesium which is in the slag, it doesn't move much. It was in the slag and it stays within that perimeter of the original slag grain. Now, does it affect mechanical performance? This again is absolutely not known because mechanical performance is you know, the amount of solids you've got, the amount of pores you've got, you've got, and it's also the connectivity between the different solids. And we have some indications, I mean, this is very, very speculative, we have some indications that if we have an awful lot of hydrotalkite here, there may not be a good bonding between the slag grain and the CSH. But this is very, very speculative, and we couldn't, can't really turn it into figures. We can't say this has this much effect on strength yet. Hopefully, in the, in the near future, we will be able to say these kind of things. But at the minute, we just don't have the good quantification of the microstructures, and we don't have the kind of mechanical models that can represent that. Strength is a very, very difficult thing to uh, calculate because it actually depends on cracks and crack propagation, and this is a very, very complex phenomenon. Yeah, I think in terms of durability, it's probably a lot less because, there's no, you know, once this hydrotalkite phase is formed, it's a very stable phase which tends just to stay there. Uh, we, don't see any, we don't see any evidence that it reacts with ions like chloride or sulfate or anything like that. But um, I think this is still an open question. Okay?